Okay, today we're going to talk about set theory. What is a set? Set theory is a very important part of mathematics, and we're going to see more about that later, but what is a set? I like to think of a set as a bag of elements, right? So we can have uh, letters in them or numbers. We can have just about anything in a set. Um, by convention, sets are designated with capital letters. Right? So this is a set right here. And elements of a set are usually designated as lowercase letters. Um, though it is possible to have a set within a set, right? If a set is like a bag, imagine a bag that has a smaller bag inside, a little coin purse or something. And so it's possible um, to have set B, for example, inside of the set A. We'll see more of that in a bit. A couple of important features. To start with, the order of the set of the elements in the set doesn't matter. So sets are traditionally written using curly braces. So for example, this is the set containing the elements one, two, and three. And the order doesn't matter. So this is equal to the set containing three, one, two. Right? It's a question of what elements are in the set, not what the order is, because a set is has this idea of an unordered bag in it, where the elements are all just thrown together, and we want to know what elements are in the bag. The second property is that repeats in the set don't matter. So we can have the set containing A and B and B and A and A and A. This is really just the same as the set containing A and B. All right. So the order doesn't matter. Repetitions don't matter. It's just a matter of what individual elements are grouped together into our set. So let's talk about set notation. We've already seen that this is the standard notation for drawing a set. Um, what we can say is if the set S contains elements A and B, then A is an element of S, right? So this symbol it's sort of like an E, except I would normally draw an E like that, or even like that. Um, this is, this is, this means element of. Okay. So I'd say that A is an element of S, and B is an element of S, but C is not an element of S. All right, so right here, uh, I'm gonna actually move this. I'm gonna say this means element of. And this one means not an element of. And I'm gonna put 
something else up here in a moment. Okay, so this is one way of drawing a set. Another way is sometimes we don't want to list all the elements. What if we have infinite elements, for example, in our set? Like we could have the set of all integers. I'm not going to sit there and draw bracket one, two, three, and so on. Um, instead, what I want to do is I want to describe the properties of the set. And that's what this set property notation means. So what I can do is I can say A is the set such that X is the element of some other set where we have a certain property of X is true. Right, so an example of this might be we can say the set of all even numbers is where x is an integer such that x equals 2 times k for some integer k. Right, so we have seen this symbol before. Right. And what this is met, uh, read as, I'm going to actually, um, I'm going to write out what this one is read as. I'm going to say this is the set of all x in S such that, that's what that line means, is such that. of x is true. Uh, right, so the second line would be read the, uh, the set of all integers such that, the set of all integers x such that x is equal to 2k for some integer k. Okay. Now finally, one last thing, I'm going to make a, a little side note up here. As I mentioned before on the previous slide, sets can also be elements of sets. What that means is that, for example, The set containing the number 1 is an element of the set containing the number 1. It's an element of the set containing the set containing element 1, 2, and even the set containing the set containing the number 3. Right. So you can sort of get lost in these squiggly marks. Uh, but the idea is, is this element is a set, and this element is a set containing a set containing an element, right? But they're all elements of this one overall set. Okay, so now let's take a look at set subsets. I'm going to say this is red subset of, so I'm saying A is a subset of B, if and only if, for all elements X, if X is an element of A, then X is also an element of B. So let's draw this, let's draw a picture. So if we have a and B, here A is a subset of B because any element right there in A is also going to be in B. Right? If we had a different drawing, if we had, for example, like that, then what that would mean is there are some elements X that are in A but aren't in B. So in this case, A would not be a subset of B. So, um, erase that for now. Um, another, there is another example here. So this is this is what's called a proper subset. 
because A is fully contained in B. And so the line underneath right there means it's like equal, right? So this is kind of like less than or equal to. Um, so it's either contained in or equal to, and this one is strictly, our example right here, it is strictly contained in, so this is known as a proper subset. Another alternative is they could be equal. Right? A could equal B because any, again, by the definition, for any X in B, in A, it's also in B. Now notice, um, that up. Um, notice that this is a universal statement, right? I'm saying for all x in A, it's also in B, right? So these are the two scenarios that are called subset. This is a uh, proper subset. This is uh, set equality. This is A equals B. And what we're saying is in both of these cases, A is a subset of B. Let's look at another one. This is proper subset. So we just mentioned that here, right? Proper subset. Um, but I'm gonna we can define it independently as well. So I can say this is A is a sub proper subset of B if and only if. Remember, that's what this means, is if and only if. A is a subset of B, but there exists an element X in B such that X is not an element of A. Right, so again, if we've got B and A, we call this a proper subset. And A is a subset of B. That's because there exists an X in B that's not an A. So these definitions are using something called the element argument, where we can talk about a generic element in the set. In this case, we keep using X, but it could be any variable. Okay, set equality, we've already sort of defined this, but again, uh, we know what this means inherently. But I'm going to say A is equal to B if and only if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, right? Because if we have that both A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, what that means, remember the definition of subset, that means for any element X in the subset, it's also in our outer set. So that means any element in A is also in B, and any element in B is also in A. This gives us set equality. So here we have A is a subset of B, and B is a subset of A gives A equals B. And this is going to end up being important because if we want to prove a property about a set, if I need to prove that one set is a subset of another one or that one set is equal to another one, we actually have to prove both of these things in order to prove that equality. Finally, we get to not a subset. And again, we sort of mentioned this before. We say A is not a subset of B if and only if. Well, think about it. If A is not a subset of B, then that means we've got to have some element like this, A and B. We're going to have some element that's in A but not in B. And that's what I'm going to write here. There exists an X 
such that x is an element of A and x is not an element of B. So we could look like this, or we could have where they're totally separate, right? Or we could even have where B is a subset of A, because again, in all three of these scenarios, there is an element in A that's not in B. So this is the not a subset. And finally, this is sort of an illustration of um, numbers and how this works. We say everything, um, we actually, I'm ignoring complex numbers here. I'm only looking at real numbers. So everything in this slide is a real number. And the rational numbers, if you recall, a rational number are fractions. So like, so real numbers include things like pi and the square root of uh, 2. But they also include things like 3.5, right? Uh, rational numbers include anything that can be made into a fraction. So 1 over any integer. So they may be very complex, like, you know, it could be 1 over a billion, but it's still 1 over an integer. Irrational numbers include things like, um, so this can be numbers 3, this could be uh, 2.7, this could be um, 1 fifth. Irrational numbers include things that cannot be written as a fraction. Uh, decimals that go on forever. So for example, pi and the square root of 2 are two examples of irrational numbers. And then since rational numbers can include anything that can be written as a fraction, the integers can all be written as a fraction. So integers are a subset of the rational numbers because they can be written things like 3 is really 3 over 1, and 8, well, that's really 8 over 1, and so on. So they are rational numbers, but when they're over 1, we, we wow, that was bad, we don't normally worry about it. We just say 3, 8, negative 2, and so on. And finally, the natural numbers are a subset of the integers. The natural numbers are defined differently in different texts by different people. They're usually either 0, 1, 2, 3, so on, or plenty of people leave off the 0. So it kind of depends on the author of the text. Um, I, I'm going to go with the convention where we leave off the 0 and that the natural numbers are the counting numbers. And if you have a bunch of things to count, you start at 1, 2, 3. Those are the natural numbers.